So I think we're good to go. Uh, thank y'all for coming to the 10 o'clock talk. Um, I can't promise you anything, but you're here. So um, so today, what I want to do, I can't move around too much. Today, what I want to talk about is the, um, basically what I see, uh, I guess, a trend in our field as we're getting younger and younger people and as technology is you know, growing and expanding. Um, so I really want to focus on what we should be focusing on. You know, we're always tantalized by all this new stuff that's coming out. And so I want to take a step back, kind of reevaluate you know, your posture, the lay of the land, and talk about methodologies and challenges that we kind of all have to deal with. And so not so much of a tool talk. There will be some tools, but really I kind of want to remove that crutch and get us back to the basics of knowing the actual, you know, the, um, the low level technology behind everything. And so I, I want to get away from, well, I need X to accomplish this, so I can't do it without it. Like, that, that's a bad mindset to have. Um, tools should empower your capabilities and, like, help you out, not be a hindrance to you. So, uh, who I am. Uh, so Dominic Pizzi, I've been doing this for about six years professionally, X amount of years prior. Um, I started off in higher education, which is probably what guess gives me my, my viewpoint of this whole thing and that's because in higher education you don't really have a budget and it's pretty much go and fix the world with nothing but some duct tape um, and so <laughs> it was it was fun it was challenging and it really you know it, it, it changed my mindset of you know thinking outside a box of how can I accomplish this without a big budget without these big fancy blinky boxes and so really um, from there did that for a little while transitioned to a sock and then that gave me um, just a lot of perspective with different clients, different industries. And I realized, you know, yeah, there's a lot of differences, but at the same, so uh, same time, there's a lot of similarities that we're all getting wrong. Um, and, and again, it's all coming down to, well, we didn't have this, so that's why that happened. And that's the wrong, it's the wrong stance on it. And so uh, recently, I just transitioned to doing more of a threat hunting. And so that's been fun the past couple of months. But that's not what we're talking about today. So uh, the focus for today is going to be what's on the slide. But really, it's you know tech industry's changed. Um, like I said, we're getting revision changes, code pushes daily, if not multiple times a day. Where before you would code something for you know to run in kilobytes of RAM, you had to be exact, precise. And nowadays, it's just like, hey, it, it ran. Let's throw some more stuff on top of it. It's fine. We'll go back and look at it later. And that's not, that doesn't ever happen. So you just get bugs after bugs after bugs. And so 
that's happening in tech in the tech industry, and it's kind of floating into the infosec industry where we're, we're losing, I guess, I guess our core values, our core capabilities, and you know, the new shiny is always kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, we need to go grab that. And I mean, if I had a budget, an infinite budget, sure, that'd be great. I would love to play with everything, but reality doesn't happen too much. Google, call me. But um, you know. You're building on a, on this crumbling foundation, and and we need to, we need to stop that. Um, so focus on the basics. Get the eighty percent right. You're gonna just just gonna you're gonna get so much return on value without that much input. Maybe a little bit of opex there, but it's not a lot of capex. Um, so at the end of this, you know, I, I hope you just think about your own personal environment, your own industry. Everyone's different. I can't talk about my situation and it apply directly to yours, but I hope you can get some ideas out of it and that's the point of this. So, security landscape. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had this conversation, but with leadership it's, why are you here? Why am I paying you to do whatever you do? And a lot of times it ends up being, well, they're more interested in what they heard about on the news or on some blog site or so-and-so told them, you know, one of their networking guys told them about this thing. And it's like, yeah, China did that really cool thing, but they're not really after us. And, you know, you have 20 Windows servers that have been patched in six months with RDP open to the internet. Is that really your threat vector that you're going with right now? And so it's, it's hard to convey that to leadership. I understand that. But... You know, there's a lot, thankfully now, there's a lot of information coming out there. There's a lot of uh, reports, threat reports coming out. And it's real data. It's what they've picked up, they've analyzed it, and now we can consume it. And it's great, because it gives us actionable items to look at. And so with that comes, I guess, compliance. And then what I like to call checkbox security. Uh, and I think a lot of people are guilty of it, unfortunately, where we think, oh, we passed an audit, so we're good. And in reality, that should be a starting point, not the goal, not the finishing line. So with that, these are some reports. So as we can see here, we have delivery method, hmm, email, quite high up there. What else are they doing? Phishing, stolen credentials. Okay, all right. What are they using to actually run their exploits? Oh, PowerShell. That's the attack matrix if y'all don't know those codes. But um, this gives us real valuable insight to what we should be looking at. And again, we can look at the top 10 vulnerabilities. This is from Recorded Future. You don't really need to look at the CVEs. I don't even know if you can read that, but basically Windows logos and Adobe logos. That's what you need to know. And then over here we have file types that are coming in with spam attachments. XLS, PDF, PDF, JS, VBS. Those are our high heavy hitters. And so with this, we can make an actual plan. We can circumvent these things. Yes, if you have your EDR solutions and your next gen whatever, We'll probably get this taken care of. Excellent. But what if it gets through? You're only protecting one doorway. So let's go a little bit deeper. So let's start with email. Pretty simple. It's been around for quite a while. And that's probably kind of a problem because it's kind of just shimmed RFCs after RFC to help and you know move along to the future. But these three items really should be just a foundation of how you set up your email. Um, and I'll go into the details, but basically this enables you, or enables your domain, your company, to not be easily spoofed by other people. So how does that work? Well, we got the SPF, which is the um, Center Policy Framework. And we're good. So that's the center policy framework. And all that is is a text record in your DNS domain. Uh, it's pretty simple. You can actually see an example at the bottom left. That's kind of what one looks like. And what this does is just say, hey, if you get an email from me, I should be coming from that IP address range. 
or whatever that SPF record is for that domain. And then a little squiggle all, tilde all, that just means if I don't do this, well, you decide what to do. Don't hard fail me, but it's up to you to, de to decide whether to allow me or not. And so that's great, but this is all in the envelope sender field. So if you're forwarding emails and things like that, you can actually lose this information in translation. So that's where uh, domain keys identified mail comes in. And basically this is just a signature for your domain that is put into also another text record that is actually in the header field of your emails. And so that follows it along and it's, it's a signature for you. And with those two, now you're getting somewhere where you can say, if you look on the bottom example, you can say, um, those are supposed to be dash alls, but if it's a uh, dash all, that means hard fail. So if I don't come from this result, hard fail me. And these are, that's um, from the header information of an email that I received. So you can see that it's checking the SPF record as it comes in, looking at it, and it's saying it passed. Great. Well, if you're running an, SP, uh, sorry, an email server, if you ever have, you realize just how hard that is. Um, so luckily, there is domain-based message, authentication, reporting, and conformance, DMARCs. I will never remember that. Um, what that does is give you, it gives you reporting capability. So basically, um, I send you a bunch of emails. All of a sudden, they're getting dropped for whatever reason. I'm going to get a report back on saying, hey, you're getting a high influx of uh, dropped emails. And then, so now you can go and take a look at your SPF record or your signature and see what's going on. So that right there is just huge as far as people can't send email on your behalf pretending to be you. Your users can't get emails from external people pretending to be internal people. And that right there is just such a huge benefit. And it's not that difficult. So next, simple things, right? Like I said, we're going back to the basics. Real-time black hole list, return path reputation networks. These are all things that exchange or mail proxy insert of choice can do. Um, there are some lists included. We have geoblocks. Do you need to be called talk, contacting to all these overseas places? Maybe, I don't know, that's up to you, do you? But you can block them based on IP or just a TLD. So if you have a .cn, I don't need that, even if it is from a US IP address. And the big one, I think, file attachments. <laughs> you should know what you are allowing into your environment. You can monitor this, you can report on it, you can get analytics and metrics from it. Um, it's 2019, XLS and doc, there's no reason for those. The issue with those is that you can put macros in them and you don't realize it. Um, with the newer formats, with the XML formats, you have docm, xlsm, so you know it's a macro enabled file, so you automatically can say, I don't want this from an external user, say. Um, so, I did a nice little, we'll see how this loads. Uh, hey, it loaded, nice. So, I compiled this list, and this is again, I'll share all the slides and everything like that. But basically, um, it's a list compiled from the office recommendations on Microsoft site, see, source, and then Symantec, and then some custom rules from random sources, and a whole bunch of them. And what this does is all it does is go through, make a nice array, dedupe, organize, sorts. All right, so with that, let's see, with those lists of 100 and something each, we end up with 189 unique values. Now, it's up to you to decide, you know, maybe you need zip coming in, which you most likely do, but .z, .zz, .isos, things like that, I really doubt you should be getting those emails from external. Internal, internal, sure, maybe. But, you know, you need to look at these and, you know, look again, look at your logs and say, are people sending these? Am I gonna impact the business? So that's all there available for you. Do with it what you like, don't blame me for anything. And then, you know, that solves a lot of problems, right? But there's always more. Uh, they always figure out a way to get through. And so these are some real life examples of just some out of the box ways I had to deal with some email. So bad words up here, but 
Um, I had a particular client that was just getting inundated with extortion emails about all types of crap. I watched you do this, FBI, yada, yada. I mean, just multiple people internal, all different senders, all different um, host providers. There wasn't really a, uh, an elegant solution until I was like, hey, I mean, we have a pattern. We have, you know, these 100 emails. See if we can find a pattern with these. So wrote a regex, which basically just says space, any of these words, anything with an imgur or a YouTube link at the end, just quarantine that. Let someone review that. That was a 90% reduction of emails getting to users right away. Uh, they were very happy with that. Again, I didn't have to go and try to connect some weird solution and connect everything. I just went back to regex, good old regex. And the same thing with uh, Bitcoin scams. Um, again, just looking for BTC or Bitcoin, some spaces, words, and then any of those with a 35 character, 26 to 35 character uh, string, which would be the address for the Bitcoin wallet. That again was a 96% reduction. Um, that particular client definitely didn't do any type of whatever, Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever. Um, so we didn't need to have that. Now, you know, caveat, there was a 100% reduction in emails because I forgot to space the BTC. And um, unfortunately, HTML encoded stuff has uh, BTC in strings pretty often. So that was a little oopsie moment. But it only happened for like five minutes. So no one noticed except for the email guys. <laughs> Uh, they were nice to tell me. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess that's a side note. Uh, don't make changes before you leave. Always stay there and test them for a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if you've had that issue. So um, regex, uh, there's a little tester down there. That's the one I usually use just to put in a string, like a big RAM string, and then see how my regex is working. Uh, it's an awesome tool. Highly recommend it. Now, this one, this one's pretty fun. Um, spoof names. I don't know if you get this, but we have a lot of people always saying, like, Hey, so and so, I need you to give me whatever uh, gift card or you know the wallet address or credit card number so I can go buy this thing real quick. It's urgent, and it always comes from you know a C level. Let's just say a director, or a C level name to someone that has a position of power that can you know, implement that or do that. Um, so, how do we combat that? Well. Not the easiest thing in the world, but not too hard either. So wrote a PowerShell script that um, all it does is walk through your AD org. So basically, give it a user. So let's say you want your CEO. Spit it in there. Um, do one, two, three levels deep, however deep you want to recurse down into your org, whoever has authority. And then it'll print back something that looks like this, where it's you know director, then all the managers. And if the managers have people underneath them, it'll give you all them. And if they have people underneath them, it'll give you all them, if you want it that deep. And what you can do with that is, well, now you can set up a transport rule, right, in exchange. And it just says, hey, um, if people with these names are sending email to us, not from these email addresses, don't allow them, quarantine them. And so that right there was also a huge win. And again, that's on GitHub. You can go check it out. It's pretty simple. But the whole point of this is just to show that you don't need every fancy thing, right? And of course, something always gets through. So we are depending on the users at the end of the day. Um, what can we do about that? Well, phishing campaigns are great. And I don't mean the really crappy ones, just little marquee things, you know, going around the thing and saying, click me, click me, click me. No. Look, if, you if your company has a weekly report that goes out or something like that, copy that. Make it hard. Don't make it easy so your numbers look good because then you're not getting any value out of it. Make it difficult, clone one of those emails and get some good work out of it. Um, Go, GoFish is an awesome open source free tool if you don't have anything commercial. Um, works really well, it's written in Go, easy to compile and run, very cool. Now, Gamify as well. So you can set up a PowerShell script. Maybe you have um, an exchange button you know, in Outlook that says you know, spam. Send, this is spam. Great, you get that into a folder. You can have a PowerShell thing run once a month that just says, all right, cool, I got um, you know, 1,000 emails, pick a random one, and this person now gets a $25 gift card. Yeah, it's great to get a $25 gift card, but the more important thing is that people know that it's being looked at. You know, worst thing you can do is just send stuff to a black box if people don't think that there's a point of doing it. You want them to know that, that they're being heard. 
And of course, metrics. I think it goes without saying, but everything, every win that you have needs to be broken down into numbers, percentages for your leadership so you can show your value so that you can earn more of that pie the next uh, quarter. And as well, just help out your community. Uh, reporting's pretty easy. Uh, I actually use Decent Security, this little link right here. Basically, it's kept up to date of all the ways to report to different things. And so I don't do them all, but I generally always submit to Palo Alto and then the, uh, the Google one. Uh, I always do those, and it's pretty quick as far as how quick that propagates throughout all different rule sets. So just help out your community. If you get something that's bad, that's not getting caught, that nothing is showing as malicious, help out everybody. You know, take that two minutes to help us out. And again, I use this site. It, uh, it's kept updated, so. And just real quick, this is kind of what GoFish looks like if you want to take a look at it. Like I said, super easy to run. But you can see here how many were sent, open, clicked, and then submitted data. And you can set it up to where you can look at the submitted data or not look at the submitted data, you know, obviously, for obvious reasons. But really, if you have a smaller org, you know, set this up or just test it out in a small environment, it's, it's really easy just, just to get going. All right. All right, office docs. Like I said, if we remember those slides, a few, few, few slides back, um, XLS, doc, all those, that, those are our main problem child. So, how does this work? Well, if you look at all the reports, if you read some blog posts, I mean, it, it's all, that they're launching shells somehow through macros, Word, whatever. That's how they're, they're doing it. So what can we do about that? Well, these three items right here, I'm gonna show you that real quick. So, Microsoft, Windows 10, caveat, Windows 10. It's kind of like the, the EMET replacement, but um, these are rules that are built into the Windows Defender security suite. Uh, they're part of the exploit package of it, not necessarily the AV package, so you can have your own you know, corporate AV while still running Defender. It's not gonna, like, they're not gonna step on each other. But these rules right here, uh, second one, block all office applications from creating child processes. That's pretty neat. I don't know of any really scenario where a user needs to have an office doc that launches some type of application from it. I'm sure you can come up with some, sure, sure, but mm, small percentage. And then that bottom one as well. Block Adobe Reader from creating child processes. All right, now we're getting somewhere. So that was Windows and the Adobe. So great, that's a feature that's there. Uh, how do we actually do that? Well, like this. So this is a sample of the test I'm about to show you. So basically, it's just calling a .NET web object and downloading a file from my GitHub. And if you take that code and you want to escape all the um, quotes, that's what it looks like in a macro in an Office doc. And I mean, basically, it's just calling PowerShell as a command, run, run this as a command, downloading a file from that location and saving it to bad.txt in my home drive. See if it works. Magic. <laughs> so pause. All right, pay attention to the file folder over here. So I'm launching sample1.doc. Super secret. Notice now there's a bad.txt in the file explorer. So had that been an actual malicious script downloading a file which would then execute something else or pull down something malicious from the internet, would have been all good. And we can see, I can exit out of that. Yes. We can see here, this is what it looks like. It's a WinWord exe that just didn't cause PowerShell. So we saw that it caused a child process. Well, let's change that. So uh, I'm using PowerShell right now as an admin and add MP preference is the command, and I want to call the attack surface reduction rules, and that string is the one that is for uh, office docs to block child processes. So I'm enabling that, and we can see here, 
if you look at your GPO, you can see here attack surface reduction. That's where you can also change it if you want to do it that way. All right. So let's see what happens. Again, launching file. Oh, look at that. Action blocked. Ah, that sucks. Hey, you can even debug it and see what, what it blocked on. And I can rewind that real quick. So you can see that is what it actually even highlights and says, hey, no good, man. We're not going to do that. Oops. Wow. Very impressive, I know, I know. Oh, no, did I lose my presentation? There we go, perfect. So. But we all know motivation drives success. There's always a way around whatever you implement. Attackers are always going to be one step ahead if they want your information bad enough. So um, CVE 2018-8414, uh, Specter Ops identified that one. I can't remember the exact context of what they did, but they were able to bypass and use some built-in uh, launchers within Windows and get around those protections. Now, it was fixed, thankfully, but you know, there's always going to be another way, another doorway. So layer your defenses. Um, and how else, you know, think about it, how else can we stop these things? Well, macros, do we need those? Potentially. Um, maybe we set up macros only to run from internal documents that we created and signed. That's an option. Uh, change the default programs. If you have script files, you know, you can change the notepad or software restriction policies, or even app locker if you want to get more advanced. But they're all built into the OS. But there's always more problems. <laughs> uh, so here's two different ways. Uh, invoke web request is basically calling a remote site, and I'm getting the information from it. You can see a 200 code. And then you can see here, if you actually use the .met .NET method that there's no user agent or anything like that unless you specify it. There is a default PowerShell user agent in the um, invoke web request, but you can modify that if you want. So, hmm, hmm, hmm. What can we do if it gets around our SEPs? Well, we can block processes maybe from getting to the internet at all. Or we can set up monitoring for user agents based on their strings. So, here I am. Uh, I made a, a new firewall rule, a Windows firewall, uh, called PS Web Block, and said outbound, action block, for only this program, PowerShell.exe, only protocol TCP, and only going to HTTP or HTTPS. You get a success, great. We have a new rule, we can see it in the Windows firewall, GUI over here, PS Web Block, Awesome. What happens with that? Ah, yes, it can't do anything. And that's what we wanted, right? Um, the few scenarios I can think of where you would want to get internet access for PowerShell and stuff like that is if you're loading custom modules from the internet and things like that, but you can have a developer group or an admin group where you have to escalate or be part of a special, highly, you know, more authenticated group to then do these things. You can set up that firewall rule to only work for regular users if you want. All right. Well, after all this, we can kind of see PowerShell is kind of an issue. So, you love it and you hate it. Um, what can we do about this? So, how can we be more aware of what's going on in our environment for PowerShell? Well, we can set up logging detection, and I can show you some ways to get around that. So by default, uh, PowerShell 5 is what has all the logging goodies. PowerShell's version 2, 3, and 4, well, as you can see in a chart, some of them. Um, the logs you have to enable yourself, though. They're not by default. You got to turn them on. And they log to those two default locations in your event viewer. 
and there's three log types, uh, transcription, module, and script block. Transcription is actually local. That's not going to be logged to Event Viewer. That's going to be logged to a file on the system. You can change that to maybe a network share if you want. But that is going to be a full transcription of everything that happens at that console. What they're typing, what's coming back out, everything. Very noisy, but it has a lot of information. And thankfully, it is local, so it's not like you're sending it over the, the wire. Um, modules just show what modules are being called. So if I use a get date module, or like if I, the previous slide, the invoke net firewall or new net firewall, it would show that, and that would be it. Just saying that that got called, and this is a response from it. And then the script block logging will actually show the entire script block that gets run. So if I run a full command with you know all these tags and then file names here and locations, it'll show all of that. And you can do each one of those individually as far as logging setup. And here you can see a sample of basically changing the, um, the turn on module logging. I told that's the only one I turned on. And then I put a, an asterisk value for any modules log it. You can specify some are noisy, and there's some lists out there on GitHub of uh, potentially malicious modules that you want to take an extra look at. So if it is causing too much noise, you can modify that. And you can see once I turn that on, now I'm getting operational logs. And if we look at it, when I run the get date command, now I have command invocation get date. So now I know what happens, and I know what's been returned. So uh, logging, I have a lot of links, just FYI, in the notes section of all these slides. So when, when I re release them, go as deep and nerdy as you want. There's plenty of information here. But for the sake of this time, um, those are the event IDs that you want to get. Uh, you want to see what is actually, if a PowerShell process runs, if a new service from PowerShell runs, that's very interesting. And you can search for strings to detect obfuscation, which I'm about to show you. And look for encoded commands. So there is an ENC flag, not just ENC as you'll see, that will enable you to base64 encode or other encoding methods if you would like your, um, your, your strings or your commands. So uh, we go on Sigma rules. Uh, this is basically like an agnostic, was it YAML, Yara, I forget, um, rule set that you can use for your SIMs or detections. And here are just two right here. Uh, on the one on the left, you can see the system net web client download string. So all this is looking for that or the download file. And it's going to make an alert for that. And you can see it's even mapped to the attack matrix. And the one on the right, he is looking for a client IP, URL, or user agent to look like, you know, wildcard Windows PowerShell. Another obvious sign that PowerShell is attempting to get something from the internet. So here's rules for you already that you can set up for alerting. And there's a lot more in that repository. And here, as I was talking about obfuscation, uh, both these commands are totally valid. Yeah, you can escape it to your heart's content, which is why it makes it difficult to actually set up alerts for these and why sometimes you have to brute force it just to say, if this guy's running a string of 80 characters in a PowerShell command, that's just odd. Like, what is he doing? And so you might have to brute force it. You can see here, uh, if I call a full path of calc, I can do it with the question marks or without it, and it loads up just fine. And there's a lot more information about that in that link. So that's PowerShell in a nutshell. <laughs> It's uh, quite powerful, and yeah, it's unfortunate, but it, it's also really useful, and it's what I write a lot of my stuff in nowadays. So let's talk about network now. Network security. Again, simple like the email. Blocks are your friends, blacklist, TLDs. Do we need these things? I don't know, but you should be able to know if you're looking in your environment. Now. Some other things are NetFlow. I know full packet capture is a dream, pretty much all of us. Uh, but NetFlow is something more manageable. You can get metadata pretty well, pretty easily. Um, proper segmentation of your networks. You know, you should only have client, or you should not have client to client communications, client to server, server to client. There's no reason for us to be talking on a network share together, client to client. Um, URL shorteners are, I guess I'm noticing more emails come through with them, but one in particular is um, 
cut.us or something like that. I'm seeing that a lot lately. And that like, like Bitly has a pretty good report of, you know, I can report that and within minutes it's, it's taken care of. Cut.us or whatever it is, is not, everything I've seen from there is just nefarious. So I would just block that if possible. And then maybe some other things, if you're comfortable with that, you have all these things done. Well, what about dynamic DNS? Why are users going to domains that are hosted in dynamic DNS? Um, I've had situations where it's, I've only seen really developers and admins like randomly SSHing into things. They have the home network maybe. I've seen that, but otherwise, if you're any type of legit domain, you would own your own domain. So there's lists out there that you can check against in your logs, um, do some lookups with, very convenient. And then public DNS as well, not quite as useful, but it is, it does identify if you have systems that are supposedly on your AD network and with your configuration, not talking to your DNS servers. Uh, so that can be an indicator of something going on. Maybe a user changed it, maybe not, who knows. But you can find out. And then, I would like your help on this one. Uh, for newly observed domains, so anything less than seven days or 30 days, things like that, um, real obvious sign of, I probably don't want you going there right away. I've only found this one free link with some, uh, with some list in it. If you have more, please send them to me because I looked and looked. So I would like some more. And then user agents as well. You can look at known malicious user agents for like uh, Empire, or any of these other Mimikatz, Metasploit, whatever. You can, you can look at user agents that they use and you can make a list of those and see if they're being run on your network. And this one's fun. I actually just found out about this one. Uh, so we always, we're always worried about what's coming into our network but not necessarily what's going out as far as a port perspective. And so if you go to allports.exposed, it'll tell you all your ports that are exposed. It's, um, you can run it in a loop basically and you can hit it with every single port and you can see what's getting out of your firewall. Really convenient because when you're talking to things in like above 10,000, you kind of want to question that. <laughs> so it's a, again, don't just say block and then you know get the screams on the phones. Let's not do that, but start monitoring that and see if there's a business justification for it. And that brings me back to a point I forgot to mention as well. On the PowerShell, on the blocking of office documents loading child processes, you can set that just to an audit mode if you're worried about what that can cause. And you can monitor it and you can say, well, is there business justification for this? Is there a legit reason for it? So don't be worried about breaking stuff. What time? All right. I'm going to speed through this next section a little bit, if I can find my mouse. I don't really want to talk about this too much. Uh, you get cross-eyed with it. it. It's a necessary evil. And I say that condescendingly, but they really have gotten better the past few years. I know 10 years ago, these were something else. Let's just say that. Nowadays, they're, they're pretty applicable. And they're good, again, you know, starting, starting lines. They're not the goals. Um, but here, let's see. So, you know, we have all these choices, and sometimes it can get a little, a little much, but generally speaking, starting off with a CSF is a good way to go. And all these are doing is just good standards and baselines that you should be incorporating into your environment, into your policies, into your configurations. Um, there's nothing magic about them, it's just, it's already done for you. And you don't have to do all of them. You can go and compare and compare your own systems, like what do mine look like compared to this, this rule set. Um, it's just, it's, it's nice to have to point at something of what we should be doing versus, you know, someone asking you, well, what should we be logging? How should this be set up? Well, why do I have the authority to say that? You know, here's some great guidelines really smart people have created. Let's start there. And so uh, the CSF, yeah, there you go. Um, it's just, like I said, basic standards and best practices. There's five main function identities and then it goes out into categories and subcategories. It's pretty easy to follow, honestly, for, for a framework. <laughs> uh, it's about as good as you can get, about as simple as you can get. And if we had to take a look at that, here's just some screenshots from it, uh, from the PDF. And you can see, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. 
and then it's broken down into categories. And then you can measure against those, am I you know, doing what X says to identify that? Well, we can check it. And, missed. Here we go. Stigs. Stigs are really cool. They were first created for, I think, the DOD started doing them. So, you know, everyone always asks, like, well, what should I, how should I set up my configuration? Eh, pick one, unless you have compliance reasons for your industry, then definitely pick the right one. But, you know, these are really simple XML files of just, again, like, is my firewall turned on? Does my um, password lock after three attempts? Um, there's a 10 password history, so you can't reuse the same password. Um, things like that. And you can see here, if you use stigviewer.com, since they're all XML files, um, it's kind of hard to read, but you can go to stigviewer.com, and I was just taking a look at the Windows 10, and the very first like high critical finding, and just says value, no landman hash, one. So is that turned off? Well, let me check my system. Well, let me check my, yep, yes it is, cool. So obviously, if we were gonna be implementing this, we don't wanna go line by line. And thankfully, there's a way to get around that. <laughs> so most of these, like I said, are in XML files. I'm trying to remember the actual format. It's like an ASDMX or a ADMX, I think ADMX. And so it's a configuration file where you can actually load that and you can, it'll just set everything for you. And do a backup of your previous settings before. And then CIS benchmarks, uh, pretty much the same thing as the STIGs as far as just, well, here it's sections. Count policies, local policies, event logs, how should those things be set up? And you can dive down into that. And then we get in the top 20 controls, which, you know, that's famous SANS, right? But it is important. And these still aren't being done right today. Uh, like, it, it literally has a number, it has top 20. Like, we should be doing that. We're all about the numbers games. And we don't do these things. Uh, inventory and authorized and unauthorized devices. Well, if you have AD, it's pretty easy to find out. So according to SANS, and their little posters, this is kind of what it should look like, right? You get control framework, and your program framework, and then your risk framework, which we're gonna gloss right over today. Um, but you can see that's kind of what the recommendations are, and you know, I'm not one for reinventing the wheel. Uh, might as well go with the flow. And you can see how they map to the actual CIS controls and the, uh, the CSF controls right here. So there is some overlap, which is good, and they're starting to realize that, which is good, because we don't want 10 different things to look at. And a really useful feature is um, that link up there. Um, so that brings you to the NIST website where you can search for, I don't know, Adobe or Windows 10 or IBM and it'll pull up all the different configuration policies that they have from all those different sources. And then here you can see PowerSig. I just found out about this yesterday. So Microsoft and all their wisdom actually made a PowerShell module to load in specific SIGs from the website and either compare or implement them on your systems. Very cool. Obviously, it's not the whole entire index. They're focusing on the Microsoft stuff, but it is really convenient. And here's what I was talking about. Literally, one website, compliance, Windows 10. I got STIGs, I got CIS, which version? Great. I can start. I have a starting point. And like I said, risk assessment, uh, assessment we're gonna skip over this, because time is short. So. Now moving on to endpoint security. Um, again, EDR solutions are great, but if you don't, just being able to query your endpoints is a great feature. PowerShell by itself, if you have it set up right, can do this. Now it's not all scripted or agent like that, but you can go in and you can say, well, invoke this for that system and pull this information from it. Collide's really awesome, I believe. I forgot who invented that first, it's Facebook or not, but it's a really cool feature where you can basically do SQL syntax. It's an agent that runs on the systems. Do SQL syntax, and you can get back whatever information you query for. And GUR is pretty similar. That's from Google, uh, where it's Python, though. And again, it's an agent system where you can then query the boxes that you want. 
very useful in an IR situation. And then Uza, if you haven't checked it out, it's just really cool. Go check it out. It's, uh, it's an actual endpoint. Uh, it's an EDR tool, open source. Go check it out. And then admin rights. Uh, I don't really need to say it, but don't, don't have it. <laughs> uh, LAPS is also another really easy, convenient you know, solution from Microsoft to give you different admin passwords, local admin passwords per machine, instead of having a global admin password for your entire org or your forest. And then I know I talked a lot about logging earlier. And again, like I said, all these slides have excellent resources. But here's where you should go. Like, just, just go there. Go there, read it, absorb it. That's, that's really all you need. And then we get to OS hardening. Um, again, they have the ADMX. I'm not going to get that file extension right. But they have, Microsoft themselves have best practice configurations, kind of like the, uh, the STIGs and the CIS, where you can go download a configuration for your GPO and play with it. And power SIG again. So, always OSINT yourself, right? It's pretty easy. Uh, this first link, just found out about that one. Basically, is it looks for similar domains to your own. I haven't tested it out yet. No guarantees, but it looks cool. Um, the Harvester, if you haven't heard of it, it's an awesome program. It'll search different uh, repos, either Google Search Engine, Bing, or some other repositories for whatever information you send it, and I'll show that to you in a second. And then Shodan. Uh, that's where you can just pull up you know, an online scanner to basically scan the internet. Now you can get free, you know, free external scanning for your systems and go look at what they found. Great. Cert.shell is a really cool feature just to give you um, what certifications are for what organizations. So if you want to search example.com, you can see all of their certs that are assigned to them, which can come in handy if you want to map that back to other organizations. And the DNS dumpster as well. It'll find basically any subdomain of what you throw at it. So let's try that out. Actually, I should have started this in the beginning. Dual core, core i5, and something went wrong. Guess we're not going to get it today. Try it one more time. I fixed it. Um, so I'm going to let that run for a second. Let's check out. I might be blocked on the guest network. I guess we'll find out. I think I am. Yep. Oops, wrong one. Well, I think I've been denied on all of them. Network is no fun. <laughs> all right. Well, they're pretty simple. Uh, I'll actually throw in some screenshots of this then before I uh, upload them. Let you guys see that in action. So I highly doubt the harvester is going to work. Please be in command history. Hey, hey, cool. So this is it. Uh, basically, the harvester, and I'm saying go query for Google.com. Only return 50 items and search. Hi, folks. I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, we had one of the capture devices freeze up, and we have no audio for the rest of this particular presentation. Sorry for the inconvenience.